Lawrence, let's jump right into it. Idiots on a plane. Here we are sending influencers down to Cancun and they're drinking on the plane. They're vaping, seemingly smoking, let's call it that, on the plane causing nothing but a nightmare for, I think it was um, SunQuest, the airline, and those poor you know, stewardesses and attendants who are trying to, to manage this reckless group of, of influencers, well, half of them or more than half of them are stuck and now they're all facing the, the challenges of coming back to Canada, the fines, the, you know, the government who's after them, the anger of all of the people in Canada who are, you know, how is it that this is allowed? I understand this was a chartered flight, but there are rules on any plane. We're going to jump into all sorts of conversation about COVID-related stuff. And folks, it's just easy to jump on the stuff that is nationally polarizing, the anger of these idiots. Lawrence, give me your thoughts. Well, it's Sunwing Anger Airlines, um, not SunQuest. Um, but <laughs> at the same time, you. if they would have had influencers like us on the plane to monitor them, we'd have a different story, right? But uh, we didn't have the invite so life <laughs> Lawrence I like that idea if we were the influencers if we were on that plane yeah but there would have been all sorts of conversation about Red River carts um about the the the, the pathways that our people have gone through right probably I don't know if we would have snuck on our own pemmican maybe that's what would have happened but you're right maybe there would have been a little bit more control but they certainly let you know um much to the chagrin I'm sure of that of Sunwing how do you manage that? But it is shameful. It is. I mean, and then also they started to issue a punishment, you know, for them. You know, you, could, you were not allowed to come back or you're stranded and, you know. And, uh, yeah, so whatever. It's th those those guys who just want to sit there and date and have a party. And, like, it's a nightclub on the plane. Like, it doesn't. Yeah. Like, wait till you get to the Sorry, hotel folks. or a bar. Like. That's all you had to wait for. There are rules. There's rules for everyone when it comes to that. But maybe there aren't rules for everybody. Look at Novak Djokovic now. He's just arrived in Australia to play the Australian Open. That's the start of the tennis season. Um, and he's non-vaccinated. And yet somehow there was some allowance in that very strict country that he's potentially got some allowance to land, but maybe not. But maybe he can potentially look at going towards some states in Australia, but maybe not what a gong show that is. And and what's going to be the right answer? Well, the only uh, allowance that's allowed for him is the fact that he's, they, they allow you, if you catch COVID, they allow you to stay in the country for two to 90 days or whatever. That's their rule. So he's claiming that he caught COVID on December 16th. But he's he's not he can't prove it, like uh, like well I don't know how they're using a, a test maybe from somebody else or there's some there's some issues there that they're going well, um, but you you tested COVID and then the day after you went to an event in Croatia or Serbia or wherever you're from right and on the day after at an event with a bunch of kids why didn't you quarantine if you caught COVID. So there, there's a lot of questions around, well, did you actually catch it or didn't you? So don't, don't reason, you know, you know, you're a professional athlete. You know, you either have to pick and choose whether you're going to be vaccinated or not. It doesn't necessarily mean that you can attend your own sporting events if other people can't, right? And in Australia, they're very strict on it. It's like even if it's one or two cases, the whole city, the whole city will, will, will shut down. Right, so you're going to affect a lot of people if you carry it, and if you catch it right now, at, as a tournament athlete, there because it's a, a long period of it's a, a long tournament, right? And, and if you catch it, you know then what happens? You're just going to be kicked out of the, the tournament entirely, and then what's all this stuff for? You know, at the end of the day. So yeah, it's been a pretty big slap in the face to all of those people within these these communities within that nation who have been trying to do their part and he is a superstar there's no doubt in my mind but i i'm not sure if that you know precludes you having to follow certain rules and it just seems like he's 
playing a bit of the game in order to try and capitalize on the opportunity. You know, right now in, in Quebec, you know, I was just reading that they've changed some of the rules that now if you're not vaccinated, you're not even allowed to go to the uh, alcohol stores. You're not allowed to go to the cannabis stores and they've seen their rate of vaccination go, I think it's from 1500 a day to 6,000. So it's a fourfold increase of people who are trying to get their shots because all of a sudden, you know, they're starting to see limitations and maybe, maybe this is some of the actions that are going to continue. And again, Australia's, you know, trying to figure out um, and navigate this as well. Just happens to be on a really big stage. I just, I just hope, you know, it's, uh, it doesn't affect, you know, your, your, your vital population that, you know, the people who, require alcohol to be in their body and as soon as it's you know shut off completely that might create some more health problems right so you know i think quebec government really needs to be uh, have exemptions i think for a lot of those individuals that are kind of suffering through that um but the other ones yeah definitely it's probably an inconvenience for sure well and you're right on a you know that's the challenge of working in such a large capacity on a case-by-case basis um, you know, we don't probably have the opportunity at this time to put forward the resources to try and identify what every individual's needs are. But having a wife who's a nurse practitioner in the world of, of um, addictions and substance abuse and in those worlds, those are challenges for that population and that community. So perhaps this is just something that Quebec is trying to to get more members to join. You know, right now, Lawrence, you know, you and I were talking um, uh, this week that really that really came to the forefront was in Edmonton big story that is suggesting and now this is alleged and they're starting the investigation um, in our province that there are people who are seemingly would be non-vaccinated getting the homeless population and paying them to go in and use their health information get vaccinated Apparently, this one individual who, this homeless individual who had spoke to um, a nurse at one of the care facilities, had indicated there was one day he was vaccinated seven times. Right. Now, that's indicating that at least seven different people or an agency is behind this. Now, this individual was receiving like $100, uh, but whoever's out there must be paying thousands of dollars in order to utilize, um, you know, inappropriately take advantage of somebody to get a vaccination because they want the QR code. They want to be able to say and prove uh, on their phone, oh, I was vaccinated, therefore now I can go into restaurants and I could do whatever, and yet they weren't. What level of shame are we at when this is what's occurring? I mean, wow. I mean, the the amount of uh, vaccine that's in this one individual and, you know, my uh, my wife got her she was getting her booster and we were on a way to get it and she was kind of you know worried about it obviously because side effects and whatnot and, and uh i just kind of said well there's a homeless guy who got it seven times right yeah. uh and yeah. he's still around uh but at the same time i'm sure he's probably not feeling very well and that's why he went to go see a nurse yeah actually you know what lawrence having been a registered nurse before that's a fantastic point that is actually not something i thought about Maybe he was looking for healthcare access to, to talk to somebody because he was feeling so unwell. You're right. Every time I've gotten a shot, oh, it beats me up a fair bit. Um, and I can understand your wife's sort of response to that. But by the, you know, the, the sad part of our conversation is just that people are taking advantage of other people in dire situations for, you know, a means to an end. And Hopefully the police, and this is, you know, thank them for being our first responders and for their roles out there, you know, protecting this, this part of our population. I I never even would have thought until this article came out. But again, that's why I guess I'm not a great um, investigator. I just always assume everybody's in it for the good. No, there is people out there who are seeing the bad side of things. Sorry. (laughs) Sorry, I don't know. No, not at all. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. And you do sound better, Lawrence, from last week. Um, yeah, you, you'd gotten beat up with your voice sounds fabulous. Bring that guitar down and play a quick tune for us. Yeah. <laughs> no, I got a cold. <laughs> yes, I got a cold. I've been tested. Um, but even if my negative is still there, it's, um, I'm well over it. But no, I was the only one in the household with got a cold. Strange, but um, I was nervous, of course. And it certainly didn't sound the best on the last podcast. But... Um, I, you know, what I was going to say is, you know, this, this individual who, who uh, certainly got the seven vaccines, 
you know, for him to, you know, consistently put up his hand and go, I'll take it, you know, I'll take it. Right. Um, but certainly you're, you're, you're going to the less vulnerable population to do it. And I think that's, uh, you know, abhorrent and it's, it's terrible what you're doing, but. Yeah. Taking advantage of vulnerable population. Um, right now in Manitoba, apparently 75% of the Manitoba first nations, uh, have COVID. So, you know, this new variant, we are seeing it. It's, it's, it's easily transmissible. It's getting through the system. We're still trying to figure out, is it a good thing that we're seeing this broad, um, you know, herd mentality or herd, herd, uh, application to, um, for our infection or is it, is it spearheading people? You know, times are still trying to tell every, every, um, sort of health manager within each province, the, the health officer like Dean Hinshaw is they're they're just trying to continue to follow the stats and share it with us. So big, big thank you to them. Lawrence, I'd like to say a big um, thank you and shout out to our sponsors before we move forward a little bit uh, more, the Métis Nation of Alberta and their connection with us and our community and our and allowing us to and support us when it comes to gathering and and providing us the opportunity to be a part of our podcast. And another big, very, very, very big shout out to my company, the Memphis Group, that's just a plug for me because I am here. But the real one that I want to say thank you to is the Steel River Group. They're a diverse management agency. You know, they've been very committed to our program and they strongly committed to Indigenous conversation. And they are huge in the world where they bring different companies and groups together for their energy and um, the land management. They are very involved in, in the environment. Fabulous group. Thank you again to the Steel River Group. Lawrence, let's jump into some of the next things. The um, We want to talk, let's jump into some Métis conversation. You know, we have a mixer coming up. Let's talk a little bit about that and how people can get involved and aware. Well, I think, you know, as a history sort of, uh, so everybody's kind of, you know, where this goes back to about the two presidents, Ephraim Bouvier to Marlene Lands, and they would have these mixers, um, you know, individuals who are business and professionals working in, in the community that can come together. And we did it every third Thursday of every month. And I was, that was the first place I went to when I was uh, working down here um, at the Friendship Center. And, you know, when I came and started going, I thought it was great. I, thought, I loved going to those things. And, and um, certainly with COVID, it became pretty apparent that we couldn't do those anymore. Um, we tried to do some on, on Zoom. It just didn't work out, you know. Um, but now we have one that's scheduled at the Law Heat House on, on January 20th. Um, this one will be RSVP only. We certainly want to make sure that uh, we have enough seats available for people. And certainly working with the government's conditions too, because it is a, a provincial building too. So we want to be very cognizant. We're doing all the right things. But um, RSVP is probably the, the way we'll go for now and then go from there. But uh, it's an opportunity for businesses to sit and network and, and uh, introduce yourselves to the larger uh, room and, and what your business does and, who you are and celebrate some of your successes and, and have some giveaways and some fun too. So that's what we need. So to all of our listeners out there, really important, if you want to be connected within the business and or the professional associations and the community within the Métis Nation, uh, reach out to your region, reach out to your local and say, hey, do we do business mixers? So down here in Southern Alberta, in Region 3, we do a business mixer that Lawrence is referring to. And this one's going to be held at the Lougheed House. And it's a nice way in order for us to just create a little bit of that connection and increase the awareness. So there are tools out there. But for all of us down here, Lawrence, where do you want people to RSVP to? The connect at Yeah, that's right. Connect at Métis 3 dot z o r g and our our coordinator for this this event specifically is lisa hunt and um or even call our our phone number 403-569-8800 at the regional office and uh she can definitely put you on the list and and go from there look us up folks mate3.org you'll find the website and there'll be more information on there you could reach out yeah so it will be limited just due to some of the the allowances that are occurring right now. Uh, big assembly coming up, Lawrence, in August. Yes, so um, every year, um, the uh, provincial assembly for Métis Nation of Alberta goes to every region. And region three is on, next on the list. Um, every second year now, it goes to Métis Crossing. So last year, we added a Métis Crossing. Now region three is on the list. 
And we're sort of going through all the planning right now currently and working with um, our head office to, you know, and all their staff to, to really start to coordinate um, a large event down here in, uh, in Calgary. So we, we kind of are picking Calgary. Um, I know there's questions of bringing it back to Red Deer, but the last time Reason 3 hosted it, it was in Red Deer or in Stettler. So we're certainly looking at um, getting a, um, hopefully, uh, uh, enough attendance that we can really look at this constitution and all that stuff that's really important to us right now. Yeah, and the more people who are involved, the more voices we're going to hear when it comes to that conversation about uh, the constitution. And again, folks, um, wherever you are listening across um, Canada or across our provinces, make sure you reach out to your local, reach out to your, your Métis nation and to try and get become more aware of what's happening. There's different rules in each province. There's different rules seemingly sometimes within each region of some of the allowances. And the more aware you are, the more opportunities there will be for you, A, for the education, but also there's different uh, opportunities for edu- for funding when it comes to schooling, when it comes to professional training. You know, uh, I often comment, Rupert's Land Institute, very strong um, component of our resources when it comes to opportunities for education. So make sure you look them up. Uh, the Forward Summit, Lawrence, <laughs> is it going ahead? How long have you been the chair of something that was only supposed to happen this one time? Well, you know, me and the coordinators always kind of giggle about it, but uh, definitely, you know, I was there at the beginning. They asked me, would you mind being the co-chair this year? We really want to see, you know, have a Métis leader at, at that post. And I said, sure, I'll, I'll, I'll take it on. And it's a very large um, uh, event for Indigenous relations here in pretty much Canada. And I said, it's a great opportunity for me to be seen and, and uh, be a part of. And, you know, that was right at the, the beginning of the pandemic. We didn't know it was going to happen. And then it got postponed and postponed and postponed. And, you know, I just found out this morning it got postponed again. So now we're they're thinking of May uh, 26 as the next uh, date. So to do it in person but you know we'll see what happens <laughs> the longest running chair i think is essentially what you're going to be um something i was reading today lawrence was in the library and archives of you know canada's the uh, online awareness of of uh, government of canada's archives and there's a, a great virtual exhibition that you can go to and i know i've talked about this the last few weeks because i like moving forward as i as i work through the archives and in there there's a great uh, as i comment a virtual exhibition about the metis and the reason it's nice to go to that is it it kind of simplifies things it's not a very in-depth look at who the Métis people are, but it brings a lot of the conversation pieces that you and I have talked about, you know, recently and in the past about who the Métis people are as we continue this journey. But uh, one of the other things that I I wanted to, you know, because this is the things you and I like to share is um, we did a YouTube video a while back on Métis cart trails. And a lot of the information we pull from is from archives like this, as long as the awareness, the elders, the, the books that we review, um, but let's talk just briefly a little bit so that we can encourage people to go back and look at some of those, um, that information that we have. If you look us up on the squeaky wheel, they were sort of heritage minutes. Let's talk a little bit about that one we did on Métis cart trails. Well, well certainly, you know, cart trails is very, um, it, because it talks about land use, right? And traditional land use. And, you know, the cart trails weren't necessarily just made for carts at one time. A lot of those pathways and a lot of those trails were, we're certainly First Nations and, and Métis because of our relationship that we established with our First Nation cousins and, and families, uh, we started to share a lot of these these trail systems. But when certainly when Canada encroached into the West they, and wanted to put their railway in, in different areas, uh, the railways, and they made you know legislation that protected those railways too. So a lot of them took up those car trails. And, you know, we did a study down here in Southern Alberta of the car trails and, and uh, we had you know, historians and academics take a look at it. And we noticed that, you know, about 54% of those car trails were taken up by the railway. And they certainly made it illegal for people to even reside even near them. So uh, basically all those Métis that lived along those trails um, had to move and, and move elsewhere and First Nations too, right? So. 
you know, we look at the um, <clears throat> the cart trails as being very significant to us as land use, but as well as the implications that those had on us, you know, after that. So anybody who lives near a rail line currently, whether it's CPR, you can kind of see where those kind of trails were. And, you know, people always ask me, well, <clears throat> Edmonton Trail, isn't that where the Meatsy Cart Trail is? I said, no, you go about a kilometer this way and that's where it is and that's where that rail line is. Um, now, we always we always say it, cart trails, cart trails, cart trails, because it was so important for us to travel and get to one neighborhood to the next, to one family to the next, and that's how we traded. So that's why it's so important for us to look at cart trails. That's basically it. Oh, no, absolutely. And again, these are staunch reminders that the Métis and the movement of the Red River cart was in southern Alberta. This is where the rail lines were going. And you're right. This is where a lot of them passed. Leighton, send the, send the um, signal out. The light is kind of flashing here a little bit to indicate <laughs> that it is scam time. Hold on, Lawrence. There it is there. there the, um, <laughs> this is what happens when you unplug your light. The uh, one I wanted to jump on today was, folks, when you're on um, purchasing sites, whether it's, uh, I, uh, whether it's Facebook, whether it's Kijiji, whether it's down, down in the US, these Craigslist, whether it's any of these different um, avenues of buying, if something is too good to be true, there's a good likelihood that it is. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to bait you and they will take a picture of something and say, this is what I have for sale. If you're interested in it, you just need to provide a deposit. They may even answer the phone. Um, when it comes to connecting with people over the over computers, scammers use what are called virtual private networks. So when you've sent them some money and you never hear from them again, as angry, as violated as you feel, sometimes it's generally very hard to try and find these individuals because they're using a network that is their purpose is to try and hide where they are. So folks, if it seems too good to be true, it probably is. If it seems as though it is a good opportunity, ask to meet the individual. And I know that for a lot of times, what the police were doing was, if you want to buy or sell something, come to the parking lot of a police station. There's there's some uh, cameras there. There's some awareness there. There's a certain comfort there. If you want to do a, you know, a trade when it comes to bartering, or um, this is a lot of the, your opportunities. But folks, don't get drawn into this. And anytime somebody's asking you or texting you, saying, hey, um, can you give me more information because I want to sell you something? That's your clue. Folks, don't get drawn into it. So there's our scam of the week, Lawrence. Let's jump into um, another thing. A real fun thing that I was reading about was in Northwest Territories, there's an artist, her name is Margaret Naison. She does beading. Well, one of her, um, her, some of her art is on its way to the Smithsonian in Washington. And if you look her up, um, she does a lot of beadwork that is, is, is very extra, not extraterrestrial. It's like the stars, the, the moon, and it's actually going to be residing beside a virtual gallery of Van Gogh. So to honor that artistry and to bring her beading in. So I think that's very extremely, you know, it's exciting. You know, not only is it uh, moving art like this moving around Canada, we're also starting to see it's moving international. That awareness is becoming, um, you know, uh, brought out for everybody. So I'm really excited to, to, to read about you know, things that are happening like that. And then let's jump into a last little bit of sports here, Lawrence, where we got a little bit of time. The exciting aspect of the Chargers Raiders game. Now you and I usually talk more Oilers, more Flames, maybe Raptors. We don't necessarily talk lots and lots and lots about the NFL. We'll, we'll definitely talk more about the CFL when, when it's going on. But this game was the pretty much the deciding game at the end of this um, regular season to determine which one of these teams was going to be going to the playoffs or the wild card. Yeah. And in this game, if the team tied, yeah. and it is hard to tie an NFL football game, then those teams would both go through right. and Pittsburgh was going to get kicked out. 
So folks, you may not necessarily be the biggest NFL sports fans, and I watch it sometimes just because that's what's on. But that idea that that game, that if these two teams tied, and in the end, through back and forth, back and forth and into overtime, this these teams remain tied in a fantastic football game. There's another team, Pittsburgh, sitting on the sidelines going, if these two teams tie, we're out. Now, the, the Chargers, no, the Raiders were kicking to win the game with no time left on the clock, and the kicker was 8-4-8. Eight eight. He's never missed a kick in that stadium. Two seconds left. Lawrence, if he decided not to kick, they both would have tied, and they both would have went to the playoffs. What would you have done? Well... <laughs> It's interesting for sure, but I mean, they got to go and I mean, their, their whole thing is, well, we have to win, you know, that's a coach, coach mentality. It doesn't matter what game is on the line. You have to win it. And to allow another, if you went to tie and you allow that other team to go through and all of a sudden that team beats you in the next series, well then, yeah, you look like a bunch of fools, right? So you're better (laughs) off winning that game, but it was a very interesting scenario. And they painted that scenario right before the game even started, that if these two teams tie, they both go through. And then all of a sudden they went to the end, you know, and all of a sudden they kicked the field goal and all of a sudden they're tied and there's five minutes of overtime left, right? But, yeah. And folks, this isn't a spoiler alert. If you haven't watched the game by now, (laughs) we're not giving you... But the, the, the interesting part for me was the fact that here this kicker now, the team, and you're right, I, I agree. I think that the coaches want to win. All they had to do was kick, I think it was like a 44-yard field goal uh, to win the game. And with two seconds left, they could have just let the clock run out. But I think you're right, they want to win. But the for the kicker, who is 8 for 8 never missed in that brand new stadium, boy, the pressure's on him. The worst that happens is, you know, he misses and now he's, eight for nine and but they still would have tied and they still would have went to the playoffs so you know there was a is the onus put on the kicker because should he anyways it, i thought it was it was fun it was a real unique challenge um for that team to make that decision for sure and now we're into the wild card weekend so we'll see you and i imagine all those fantasy football people out there are going to love it and I guess one last thing too, to just to talk about, and thank you, thanks to all of our first responders. And you know, Lawrence, being a, a fire captain, I have a, a right here from my heart is to all of our first responders and everybody who's an essential service. Boy, there was a extremely, extremely challenging loss of life down in New York with the Bronx fire. Um, I think they identified that 17 victims um, succumbed to likely the smoke inhalation of, of this uh, apartment fire and you know our hearts go out to those families um, and the burden that is borne by all first responders on these in situations like this where they're doing everything in their power sometimes it's accidents it's generally you know uh, an error that leads to these kind of catastrophes but as we think about all of those people who were lost in that fire all of the people who are in the challenging situation right now of our um, pandemic and those families who don't get seen Folks, make sure you reach out to the elders. Make sure you hug your children. Um, make sure you take care of your pets and realize that, you know, tragedies do happen. Um, do Let's do our best to try and avoid as many, you know, situations that put us under undue risk. And every opportunity you get every day, folks, when you live here in Southern Alberta, 300 days a year, that sun shines. Make sure just take five minutes to let that sun warm your face and you just realize how fabulous it is and the opportunity that we have to be in such a great nation. So Lawrence, help close it out here. Well, I want to thank everybody for tuning in again. Um, and uh, we look forward to more discussions uh, in the future. But I think this time around, we're going to be looking at bringing guests on. So our podcast might be a little bit longer as a result, but uh, certainly bring in some interesting folks that we kind of know through the, the homeland and, and uh, bringing them in. And uh, we're open to it. And if you want to be a guest, uh, please feel free to give us a line. Um, what is our email again, Ross? TSW at the squeaky wheel.ca. You can also reach us at Lawrence 
at thesqueakywheel.ca or ross at thesqueakywheel.ca. Folks, yeah, continue to send that information up to us. Um, thank you to Leighton behind the scenes. Thank you to the rest of our team. Thank you to everybody who helps, our, as I mentioned, our sponsors who help put this together. Uh, without you as listeners, uh, folks, we wouldn't be able to do this, but we're just trying to bring a little bit of conversation from a Métis perspective in the most positive way that we can. So from the captain, Ross Memphis Pambrin, and from the president, Lawrence Gervais, and all of us here at the Squeaky Wheel, folks, keep the wheel squeaky. The Squeaky Wheel is brought to you by the Squeaky Wheel Company, co-hosted by the president, Lawrence Gervais, from MA Region 3, and the captain, Ross Memphis Pambrin. Our program is broadcast from Calgary in Region 3 of the Métis Nation of Alberta, which is part of the historic Métis Nation homeland. We also acknowledge these lands are the traditional territories of Treaty 7, the Black Creek Confederacy, Sitka, Kainai, Gani, Lutsina, and Stony Nakoda, with whom we share this land on the basis of our historical and ongoing relationships. You can always reach us for comment about our programming by email at tsw at thesqueakywheel.ca or find us on our website, www.squeakywheel.ca and our socials. For our comments, it is our focus to recognize all of our First Nations and Indigenous friends, share a connection with Métis settlements, and listen to and show respect to our Métis brothers and sisters and families. Here at the Squeaky Wheel, we give thanks to our elders for their guidance and to Mother Earth for her time she allows us to be here and share her bounty. From all of us at the Squeaky Wheel, Danze.